Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Pan-Africa Vision, broadcasted to you from Africa Media, your Pan-African channel. I'm your host, Ambe Fokwa, and we'll be looking this week at a very brilliant topic, noting that as the week did start, we had a special summit, which was noted and called the Plus 12 Special Summit of the African Union, which had as its main priority to dialogue and look at HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria as a pandemic here on the African continent. Now, the summit in itself ran from the 12th to the 16th of July and was held in Abuja of Nigeria under the theme Ownership, Accountability, and Sustainability of HIV, AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, Response in Africa, Past, Present, and Future. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in this edition of the program. We'll be taking a retrospective look at HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria as pandemics, or should we say illnesses, affecting the African continent. Now, to put together this program, of course, I couldn't do it alone. So we had to search throughout the continent to find some panelists who would, of course, come here and mm -hmm. give us some resource assistance. We went to the Tesho NGO, which actually does look at alternative measures and strategies to combat and enlighten individuals to make sure that they do know their HIV status as well as spread information to keep individuals well sensitized, so we say sen sensitized, so that they should, of course, keep themselves from being infected. Moving along, we do want to start off noting our guests who are here with us, beginning with Mr. Roland Abru. Roland, welcome to Pan-Africa Vision, sir. Thank you, Ambi. Thank you very much. Uh, and as well, we are here joined by Joel Tamutan, who is also representing Tesho as a youth coordinator, who will also be speaking with us. Mr. Joel, welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Ambi. Yes. And just like we did point out at the recent Plus 12 African Union Summit, which was held in Nigeria, to start off, um, the issue of the Millennium Development Goals was priority in that particular meeting. And African heads of states concluded that it seems the African continent is not going to reach the 2015 deadline. So before we do run directly into our panel discussion, we're going to take a look at this particular video clip to enlighten ourselves and the audience on what the M. DGs are, as well as looking at some cases of HIV infection here in Africa. Almost 6 million people are living with HIV and AIDS in South Africa. 66% of HIV positive people are receiving treatment. According to government officials, fewer babies are being born with HIV in South Africa, an estimated 107,000 in the last two years. The program to prevent mothers passing the virus to their babies was set up in 2001. HIV-positive mothers are given antiretroviral drugs, or ARVs, during pregnancy and after birth. The drug reduces the body's viral load, limiting the child's risk of contracting HIV through the umbilical cord or the mother's bodily fluids during childbirth or breastfeeding. Early detection is crucial. <laughs>
Wow, and just as you were taking a look at those images, you see the contrasting effect. You see that in South Africa, there is some strategies being implemented. And of course, we also see in Congo that an individual is complaining that no strategies are being implemented by the administration, causing us now to start to wonder. Now, as we'll be developing our discourse, we want to also note that Mr. Alain Roche, our consultant in South Africa, is also standing by. He'll be calling in and also supporting us with this panel discussion. But just to dive directly into our discourse, as we did just take a look at those images on that video, I want to put this question to you now, Mr. Roland. Now, we noted that the AU summit came out noting that we won't be able to meet the 2015 deadline as far as the Millennium Development Goals are concerned. Now, what is your personal assessment of the situation of HIV AIDS on the African continent? Looking at the African continent, I think that much has been done so far as combating the, the pandemic, HIV AIDS, and by extension, malaria and tuberculosis. And when I look at it, I think that I need to, first of all, commend the effort that has been done. I think that if you look at critically the awareness of the existence of this pandemic compared to the, the years gone, mm -hmm. you would appreciate that which has been done and look at the stakeholders as uh, doing a commendable job. You look at it also, there are so many NGOs now that are coming up purposely to create awareness and actions are being taken. For instance, there are commissions that have been served, and from time to time they organize seminars and workshops. And uh, of recent, I learned of an NGO that has been created also in Cameroon, for instance, called Tesho Foundation. And the purpose for that NGO is to see how young people especially can be educated well in advance before they get into marriage. And I think that if that kind of education is being promoted, it is because we have, the, the continent as a whole has come to awareness and have understood that if greater awareness is created as to the existence of this pandemic, then there is a possibility of combating it. And not just that also, there is a lot of funding that has been made available. And because of this increased awareness and the funds that have made available, I think that a great deal has been done to fight this pandemic at the level of African continent. That's actually true. I know your point of view is taken very well, but we need to know that the AU has said that they're not going to meet the Millennium Development Goal in 2015. So looking at that and noting that the activities and initiatives they've taken are commendable. Now, Mr. Tamutan, let me ask you, why do you think that despite their initiatives being commendable, the African continent has still been hit so hard by the HIV pandemic? Well, I want to think very much that uh, though strategies have been put in place to see into it that uh, the HIV pandemic has eradicated from Africa, they are not able to meet the deadline because these strategies have not really well been implemented. I think it's on this premise that they are thinking very much of having summits like the one that just ended in Abuja in 16 of, on the 16th of July. And uh, we very much think that now they are coming out with new plans of action which will involve the local population. And I very much think we've come up with NGOs, foundations, and use means which are common and local to the people. We are able to attain the goals on a further date of foot 2030. So Actually. I think uh, we need more information to do using local techniques. Actually, now noting that we need more information. I realize that dialoguing, as well as having institutions, NGOs, non-governmental organizations active in the field, the different ministries attempting their own initiatives as well in the field, we should also note that socially families, at that level of parents, the parents do need to take a role. Yeah. But it's strange, and I want to put this question to you now, Mr. Abu. We know that in the African cultural context, to speak with a child about sex as an activity, which is perfectly normal, it's human. Generally, every individual will engage in sexual intercourse at one point or another, perhaps whether for pleasure or for procreation. We do have to know that it's a topic that we could perhaps think some youths reach and find themselves involved in without proper orientation. Now, understanding this, do you think that parents could actually play a better role in educating their children about sex to avoid HIV infection? And how do you think that type of a dialogue could be brought up perhaps to enlighten our parents who are viewing the program? 
looking at that precisely, I think that parents have a significant role because the education of a child actually begins at home. Now, looking at the African culture, I think it has a great deal affected or promoted this, the, the HIV infection. But I think that if parents who adopt this one strategy first to promote dialogue within amongst the family, that is the parents and child or children dialogue, and that will give them an opportunity for them to have a forum where they can freely talk on any topic freely with their children. Now, the African culture, for instance, has made it in a way that uh, parents don't even interact that much with their children. And when they don't interact, how, do, how can you imagine that they can interact when it comes to sensitive areas? Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, African parents should have a review of their relationship with their children and then give this one method a try to see how they can improve on dialogue and then through that they intentionally, I insist, intentionally educate their children on the need of uh, the right or the, the, the most appropriate use of sex. And also to add, most African parents can really promote this if they choose to first of all themselves become true Christian. I think there is an aspect of our Christian values that is missing here. And if parents themselves will choose to become Christians, they can better educate their children on their Christian values. Now, mostly it's sad to discover that the African continent as a whole, majority of or, or the, the population is not made of Christians, or some people think they are made of Christians, but those are Christians on quote. They don't actually practice the Christian value. And therefore, we can really call them Christians. But I think that if parents will take this initiative and educate themselves first and then their children yeah. on their Christian values, they stand a better place to fight against this pandemic. Indeed, and that's really the point we have to take there. Parents need to educate themselves first before they do go along and educate their children. Now, just to educate the parents, our viewers as well, I want to give some statistics that I was able to compile concerning the prevalence rate of HIV AIDS here on the African continent. Now these statistics were taken from the CIA World Factbook and they denoted the prevalence for 2010. Now doing this review I discovered that 19 countries, actually the 19 highest countries with the highest prevalent HIV rate are on the African continent. So actually something of maybe the 33.3 million people living with HIV on the planet. They say that 24.5 of them are in Africa, and that's well over 60%. Now, as well, if you want to look at our continent specifically, Swaziland is said to actually have the highest HIV prevalence rate of 26.10%, and that's in southern Africa, near South Africa, of course, in Zimbabwe. The African countries, actually, and I want to link this now to what you were saying, the African countries with the lowest HIV prevalence rate are actually not Christian countries. They're countries in North Africa. And these are countries that actually they have the, should I say, preference or pertinence towards the Islamic religion. So it's instead countries with Islamic religion that have a lower prevalence rate. And we're talking of countries like Somalia, which has 0.09%, challenged only by Tunisia that has 0.10 prevalence, of course having a higher population living with the illness though. Then we have other countries like Egypt, Morocco, and Madagascar that also have a 0.10% percent prevalence rate. So I want to bring this question now over to you now, Mr. Tamutan. We actually see that the more liberal regions of the continent, the Christian countries, actually have the higher prevalence rate of HIV. When we start to talk of Swaziland, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, these will be countries with predominantly Christian culture and Christian orientation. And then instead, to the north, the Islamic religions are more conservative. They have the lower rate. Reflecting on these statistics, which of course you now have in mind. Why do you think it is so? Okay, uh, I'm going to re reply directly, linking to what my, my collaborator just said. Uh, HIV, it's, uh, I want to look at it from the way it came first of all in Africa. When it came in Africa, we had the notion of uh, stigmatization. You know, it was something that we couldn't imagine that it would grip the society so much. So because of the lack of knowledge, you know, like it said, the lack of, my people perish because of the lack of knowledge. Because of the lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, People went into neglect, and I think uh, this aspect of uh, knowledge is something that has to be dissipated or given out 
to the population sub of Sahara, which was very much lacking. I mean, we at the start we had uh, some sort of misinformation as far as HIV AIDS is concerned. For example, some youths got the message AIDS, A I D S, as American intention to destroy sex. You can imagine what that means if uh, young people have that kind of notion. But we think that uh, because of uh, the lack of uh, knowledge, awareness of the disease, also stigmatization, and uh, in a little, in some way, poverty, you know, linked uh, had to push some of the youths and. Uh, families to face this problem. But like uh, he highlighted that families, who, uh, starting with the parents who are the head, need to educate themselves. But how do they have to educate themselves? They need to go to forums where they'll be uh, informed on yes. this. And uh, I think this is the direction which we're heading to. So yes. I think the problem is coming m more from where we were before, you know, which we're trying to clean up the mess now to head to somewhere we really want to get to. And that's uh, complete eradication of the HIV AIDS in the plant in the, in the continent. Yes. Just to add to what he's saying, uh, one thing that we need to get very clearly is if you look at, you cited the case of Muslim countries mm -hmm. with a low rate of prevalence, I wish to say that one of the most effective ways of combating a pandemic like HIV AIDS, it's not using a law like the Sharon law, which for instance, it, it declares that if a woman or a, a child or youths are caught in an illicit sexual relationship, they will be stoned to death. Now, what actually happens is they don't engage in sexual relationship not because they understood that this one is not good or it's going to like affect them negatively, but because of the fear of death. But I insist on Christianity and our Christian values because with Christianity, what actually it does is it shows to you the gospel, which we call, the, we can call it in other words, the grace, the manifestations of Christ on the, on the cross, and the benefits of that to the life of an individual. And in the course of you having insight knowledge of the gospel, what you come to discover is sex is not part of the life of a child of God until when you're married. Now, if a Christian value as such will be incorporated into the parents first, adultery will be completely kept out. And into the youths, you see fornications will be completely wiped out. And then, by extension, you discover there will be a natural elimination of HIV-8, and the pandemic will be something which in the future will be rarely heard of. I think that is a wonderful approach we can use. To yes, essentially, that. so we need to understand that it's more of development of consciousness. It's not looking at any religion as carrying a dimension of having a higher priority to enlighten people to have better morals. But better if parents do educate themselves yeah, in whichever change, religion change they have, or change even if no religion, if they are given the proper principles, then they should know, of course, that they should conduct themselves responsibly when it comes to any sexual activity. Now, we want to also note that we have Mr. Alain Roche standing by from South Africa. I want to go ahead and give over a few statements to Mr. Alain, and then we'll conclude and move forward with the dialogue on TB. Mr. Alain, are you there? Okay, it seems that we are still waiting for him to come forward. Okay, he's on. Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen Roche. Okay, it seems that he's not coming through. We'll just continue with the dialogue, and when, of course, he's ready, we'll get the intercom. Now, next in our discussion, we want to move away from talking about HIV-AIDS because the summit carried its scope on not just HIV, but as well tuberculosis and malaria. So we'll move in chronology now, looking at what exactly TB is. Now, before we do dive directly into this discourse, it's good that we, of course, should present a video clip so that we can enlighten ourselves and get some real footage Okay, Mr. Mr. Allen is there. Hello, Allen. Yeah, hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're welcome to Pan Africa Vision. Yeah. Good afternoon. Yes, Allen. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah? I'm sure you've been following the program. Yes, I was. 
Yes, and thus far we've been discussing on the prevalence of HIV AIDS here on the African continent and we were just pointing out that we have a situation in which we noted that the southern African countries which have a higher orientation towards the Christian religion instead ironically have a higher HIV prevalence rate than the northern Islamic countries. Now I don't know as you were following that dialogue did you have any sentiments that sparked you that maybe you wanted to add any comment or even since we've started what are your current reflections on the African AU summit which recently passed in Abuja, Nigeria and the outcome I mean imagine a conclusion that by 2015 our heads of states and representatives have admitted we won't meet up with our Millennium Development Goals. What are your reactions as far as this summit, which has passed this week, is concerned? Yeah, indeed. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Indeed, uh, regarding the Millennium Development Goals, uh, as far as HIV and AIDS are concerned, There is a critical issue. I think we, we in Africa, civil society organization, dealing with the issue of HIV and AIDS, have missed some points. You know, when we talk about HIV and AIDS, we need to, when we talk about diseases, we need to talk about the immunity of the disease first. Yes. Because if we don't understand the epidemiology of the disease, we cannot tackle the disease. We cannot fight it. So the first thing that I would advise people to talk about when we talk of issue of HIV and AIDS is just to locate what kind of HIV, what is the type of HIV existing in Africa. We are living in sub-Saharan Africa that is uh, composed in majority with poor people. In. So there is a type of HIV that is HIV type 2, HIV type 2, subtype C. Yes. The subtype C is a female dominantly infected. And that has a very huge impact on the society. So when we start talking about that and we look at what kind of HIV exists in the sub region where we are living, it becomes of common importance to tackle a real, real, real target group. In this case, presently, the target group we should focus on mostly is the female. Right. So, now, regarding the issue then with the Millennium Development Goal, when we focus on the wrong target, we will never reach the target. We will never reach our goal. So, 2015 is around the corner. We have a lot of effort to do. We need to raise awareness, mostly among the female, because they are the one most exposed to the HIV type two subtype C existing in the sub-Saharan African region. Oh, Unless you have other questions, I could continue, or I would like to see some reaction. Okay. Well, but the reality is very clear, and we are, I'm sure I see everyone inside the studio, we're all nodding our heads, that that is the real point there. When we are creating strategies, or should we say our governments are creating strategies to actually attack the HIV infection with a, I mean, a concrete, realistic approach to reduce it, they should really target the specific groups that they know are being highly infected. And just like you've pointed out, it is the women. Now, just starting, I want to actually go to Mr. Roland and ask, how do you think women could really be targeted? What, I mean, just you as a youth coordinator, a youth coordinator working with an NGO that does deal in that dimension of thought to create strategies to sensitize youths and adults as far as HIV is concerned. Um, sensitizing women, how would you approach them to let them understand how they need to protect themselves? I think the... <clears throat> The target group, just like you said, targeting women, it's a very strategic approach. Mm -hmm. And Teshu also has that as their objectives. And how do we go about this? We discovered that 
a majority of the problems that occur, especially in a matrimonial home, are supported or it's, it weighs more on the feminine sex. And therefore, following Tisho, which we, that's just the abbreviation, it's Team Spirit Holistic, we discovered that if young girls particularly could be well-groomed and taught, take for instance, a side simple example, most young ladies get into uh, marriage without being able to understand what it takes to do proper budgeting for their families. And if you, for instance, have a husband who doesn't earn much, take for instance, if your husband earns, say, $50, I, I use a currency which I know probably all over Africa, much, a majority of us will have an idea on the convention, convention rate, you discover that with $50, or if the husband has to take charge of the home expenses like rents and probably taxi to work and other expenditures. Utilities as well. Yeah, yeah. other utilities. At the end of the month, he will be left with something, say, a maximum of $15. With $15 for feeding, if that amount is handed to a young lady who has not been taught properly how to budget, she will automatically look at that amount to be too small to manage the family. And therefore, because she feels like the husband at home cannot be able to adequately support the family, she might want to seek assistance from outside. And with that assistance, you discover it's going to like, he never knows the person with whom he wants to meet. Because he might prob she might pro probably have done HIV, con HIV and AIDS tests before marriage, but the person she wants to seek, or the assistant she wants to seek outside, who might probably request sex before the assistance, she will not have that opportunity to do that control. Now, Teisho, for instance, takes the young lady and teach them these basic principles of budgeting and how to manage within the family context yes, and with the little they have so that when they get into marriage, they can be able to live comfortably. And secondly, we discover that most marriages are in uh, a really horrible state. Most of them are either uh, they're living on the basis of taihat or they are at the verge of divorce. Now, what actually happens... A, 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 in that kind of a marriage where a husband and wife live in the same home, but actually they are divorced, though living in, under the same roof, each of them will probably want to seek assistance from outside. Because they have, like you said a while ago, every individual at one point in time in life will have a need for sex. And so they want to meet that need out of their matrimonial home and still come back and probably one day by chance still meet together in their home. And so, you see, with this approach that we are using to see how we can improve communication, uh, we can also uh, 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 teach young ladies to get into marriage and curb uh, conflicts within the matrimonial circle, and at the same time, also see how we can resolve some of those problems and bring families that are already t torn apart. We think that it is targeting the female population and thereby uh, seriously combating the pandemic HIV and AIDS. Yes, I understand it very well. Yes, I want to link to you and then you can, of course, run with what you have to say. But what I'm understanding is that the strategy is to focus not necessarily purely on HIV, AIDS, but the social realities around it that cause the transmission. That's what I'm understanding, yes? Okay, just to add to what uh, my collaborator just said, uh, from the origin, the strategy for fighting AIDS, let me just go a bit in retrospect, yes. was uh, like AIDS is dangerous, beware, AIDS kills. Exactly. You know, in some francophone countries, you have something like Le Sida Ella, Il Tu, Protegeons Nous. You know, so it gives that notion of fear. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like the very first time you get the message, beware, you know, you have that mind of fear. You cannot even go ahead to search in detail what the, 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 the disease is all about. So from on this premise, we realized that a lot of education and sensitization had to be done. So at one point, it was moved from beware, and now they say talking about the ABC. That's abstinence, being faithful, and the use of condom. But we realized that more and more people could recite this, they could parrot out this, but it didn't help. These are people who are educated, these are people who attend seminars, they will come out with the knowledge. I mean, anybody out there in most Anglophone-speaking countries who tell about abstinence being being, uh, being, being faithful, that's for couple, and uh, the use of condom. But you accept with me very well that that could just be a notion in the mind. How do we have to do this practically? Going back to the women, the girl child, for example. If a girl child finds 
herself in a relationship, is she powerful enough to tell the boyfriend or the fiancé that she must use a condom? Let me start from there. Is she knowledgeable enough to know that I need to empower myself economically so that I cannot be dependent on a man always for him yes. to give me money and by using cash, he can influence me and get what he wants and drops anything in me which would probably affect my future somewhere. Does the girl child or women know that uh, you need to approach your husband, an African husband, in a kind of way that he's managed not to move out? I'm going to give you an example. You could have a situation where in a matrimonial home, there is a problem. Now, the African man has this uh, tendency of being the man, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say the head clearly, of the house, head of the house, you know. In Africa, the, the relation between a man and a woman is not 50-50. We have to point this very clear. Yes. That is clearly a European concept, which you will have to import it into Africa, then will fall into problems. So still working on the traditional pre premise of the man being a head of the family and having strategic roles or behaving like a king. He also has a nature in him that is a kid, you know. So I'll say to every king, in every king there's a kid. Now, when that kiddish nature of the man comes out, that means he behaves a bit funny towards the wife, it's in the place of the woman to know that I am the homemaker, I am the one to calm him down, I'm the one to talk him, to him in a particular way that will not push his ego, and you know, if he doesn't handle his ego very well, he might be tempted, he's pushed to go seek solace somewhere. Going to seek solace somewhere can cause him to get what will affect his family. So, is a woman knowledgeable enough towards this behavioral change? of communicating effectively to the husband, whom we term the head of the team. Is she knowledgeable enough to communicate properly? Is she knowledgeable enough to educate the children since it's a mother of the home? Is she knowledgeable enough to make to inform the daughters that this is how your sexual life should be? This is how what it means to abstain. This is what it means to be faithful. Faithfulness, for example, or fidelity, which is commonly called, is not a one man's thing. If we are talking about women here, it means men too need to come into rule because yes. they are husbands to these women. You would agree. If we are talking about fidelity, even in relationship or cohabiting relationship, it can't be a one man thing. Just imagine if the girl child is faithful and the man is not faithful, or vice versa, we can't, then the concept of fidelity is totally cancelled. So I think that very much Tatio attacks or goes towards the women because they have a role to play very much in Africa. They are the mothers of uh, mankind, and in Africa too, it applies in the same manner. So I think we are trying to come up with this new strategy of having a team, working as a spirit, one spirit, then holistic. Holistic now brings out what my brother is talking about, you know, towards holism, you know, looking at the divine principles of God, which I think is universal. So I think um, working on this strategy, we need to hold very much on the behavioral, on social, on a social behavior. Yes. We need a change towards that, and it has to do he has to do very much with our change of mentality, which this has to be attained through communication, effective communication. Definitely, and that is the reality there, communication. And even it links back to what Mr. Alain Roche was saying, you have to target the group and make sure that they're well sensitized. Precisely. So I want to, of course, throw this uh, clip out there before we'll transition to the next topic. Now, we want to look at what exactly is HIV AIDS. I know everyone, of course, has heard the sing song, yes, but we have to always yeah. sing it again to so we'll reiterate course, its importance. And then we'll come back and talk about tuberculosis. But first, let's find out what is AIDS. AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, which means deficient immune system. You get AIDS after becoming infected with the HIV virus. You get infected with the virus by unsafe sex, contact with blood of an infected person, for example by using a contaminated injection needle, from mother to child during pregnancy, childbirth or breastfeeding because the virus is transmitted through blood, sperm, vaginal fluids, pre-seminal fluid, breast milk. You don't have the risk of becoming infected with the virus by saliva or shaking hands. When you have HIV virus but aren't symptomatic yet, you are seropositive. That means that there are HIV antibodies in your blood. You don't need to have any signs of disease yet. An HIV infection passes through four stages. In the first stage, the body can show signs of disease like continuous fever and swollen glands. While some people who are infected remain asymptomatic in their first stage. In the second stage, recurring airway infections, skin, mouth and genital lesions often occur.
In the third stage, you may have complaints like prolonged diarrhea, excessive weight loss, tuberculosis in the lungs, and other serious infections like meningitis. Finally, besides serious infections, the nervous system may be affected in the fourth stage, which can result in motor loss or AIDS-related dementia. It may take 5 to 15 years before you know that you've got AIDS. This is because sometimes it takes longer for symptoms to occur. HIV and AIDS can be treated with medication but can't be cured. Antiretrovirals slow down the multiplication of the virus but doesn't kill it. To support the treatment, AIDS patients often get medications to boost the immune system and fight against infections. You can prevent AIDS by having safe sex and using clean needles. And that is the reality there, of course. You can, of course, prevent HIV, but there is no cure. So the reality, of course, is to struggle to not get it and then not to spread it. Now, we're still talking about HIV, but we want to look now at the next aspect of tuberculosis because we noted that tuberculosis is linked to HIV as what they call an opportunistic infection. So I know that when this AU summit came out, the main focus was HIV, but when we look at all of these issues, we know that there is a very common thread. Now, Mr. Olan, what do you understand by opportunistic infections? Uh, looking at <clears throat> the topic in question, opportunistic in infections will be those diseases which you can easily be attacked by as a result of the fact that HIV AIDS has affected you, have been infected by HIV AIDS, and your immune system has actually been weakened and therefore you can easily contaminate these diseases being an HIV patient compared to when that compared to somebody who is uh, uh, who is not HIV infected yes and also adding to that I want to bring in now Mr. Alain Rochelle who's on standby once again who followed that particular clip noting HIV AIDS Mr. Alain are you there now Yes, I'm online. Yes, sir. After just reflecting on yes, that I'll... brief video, your own reactions, I'm sure, are very ripe. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to add something about uh, the stages of HIV that we had on the slide that you shown there. I wanted to emphasize that HIV, contrary to what it was said there, has five stages. Up to five. Because we count infection as the first stage. Yeah. Infection is the first stage, the second one, zero conversion. The third one, asymptomatic HIV infection. The uh, fourth one, eight related complexes. And the last one, eight itself. Exactly. People must understand that when a person is infected with HIV, if it's the first time that a person gets in touch with HIV, he still has a chance to eliminate HIV in his body once and for all. Is that possible? Yes, it's possible if it's the first infection. But they must, they must observe certain conditions. Yes. Because there is what they call post-exposure prophylaxis. It's a treatment that is given to people who have come into contact with HIV for the first time and they realize it before 72 hours of infection. Okay, up to 72 hours. Yeah. That's roughly yes. um, three that days. That is a cure for HIV and that happens once once in a lifetime because if you get exposed in the second time and you take the same treatment that will increase the level of infection in you but mr roche let me now ask you because this is um it's not a very yeah. new phenomenon to me because i've heard about this but in three hours let me put it to you 
what are the what are the possibilities really of yeah. someone discovering that they have HIV within three hours? It would kind of be circumstantial before someone might be lucky enough to maybe have just had sex and then within that period decide maybe out of fear they just go and take a a test and they discover it. Is that how it would happen? I mean, it, it, it's yeah. it's kind of it's kind of strange. No, it will not show. You know. You know, in reality, you can contract the HIV and realize it. Because once you have had a sex without protection, with a partner that you, don't, that you do not know, sometimes it might be out of rape. Yes. Sometimes okay. it might be out of a uh, kind of unconscious circumstances, like maybe you are drunk and you get the wrong partner with you. Once you come back to your senses, you realize that I have had a sex with somebody that I don't know. You have a percentage of chances to have been infected. If in that case, you have been infected, what you have to do is to rush to the nearest clinic and ask for the post-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. Because that will act before 72 hours. And six months after, you can go and do a test. If that person was infected, you do the test, you will see that you are negative to HIV. Well, when you said six months, this idea just came into so my head. Because these are I... things that many people need to know. Yes. Yes, let, me, let me also add this question before you go, because you just mentioned six months. Well, of course, you brought out a very okay. good and brilliant point there. But yeah. I've always wanted to understand this notion of getting tested and then being told to come back again after six months, because perhaps they say on the initial screening, the HIV might not have been actually detected. Could you elaborate on that concept a bit more? Yes, of course. Um, thank you for the question. The, the, the fact that the reason why they ask people after being tested for the first time to come back in three months or six months is because the second phases of the HIV in, in infection, which is called seroconversion, takes place just after the, 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 the body has produced has produced enough antibodies for the person to be able to be tested positive to an antibody test. So we, before, I, before I go further, I would like to emphasize that when you do the test of HIV, yes. you know what we call a rapid test. That rapid test in reality is not the test to see the HIV in the body, but it's the test to to acknowledge the presence of antibodies of HIV in the body. Uh -huh. So, when you are infected for the first three months, you cannot be tested positive to an HIV test. Because the body will have not produced enough antibodies for it to react to any normal test. Well, landing with just one yeah, final question. To come back after three or six yes, let, me, let me just give you one more question again, because this is something that um, it actually went to a political yeah. level um, several years ago. I think it might have been 2011 yeah. or prior. The South African president, incumbent right now, Jacob Zuma, um, he was tried um, on accusations yeah. of rape. Um, specifically. Now, this case brought to the forefront something that has perplexed me to today with what you, of course, are pointing out. Now, Mr. Yeah. Zuma was accused of raping a woman who was a known HIV positive yeah. person. She was also a noted AIDS activist in South Africa. Yeah. And when he went to court, they asked him yeah. that are you not afraid mm -hmm. of having been contaminated? And ironically, till today, Mr. Zuma yeah. answered under oath that he okay. took a bath after having unprotected sex yeah. with this particular woman. 
Now, I'm trying to relate <laughs> this idea to what you... Yes, I mean, it's, it's really yeah. something comical to laugh at. Because you see a whole head of state of an African country. I mean, okay. and we note that Southern Africa has some of the highest HIV prevalence. He says, no, I, I took a bath. And yeah. ironically, three or four years later, not only did he also have a child, but he married a fourth or, or fifth wife. Is, is, could any of this be related to the okay. possibility of the this um, procedure to do the 72 our um, pre pre prevention method? Allow me, allow me to reply to you. Yes, please. You remember <laughs> I said to you, HIV, the type of HIV that exists in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, is the type 2 subtype C, mm -hmm. which is female dominantly infected. If you see then the ratio of infection from female to male, it is mostly female for one reason. The male has many possibility not to be infected with HIV at first time. The first reason is if the male is circumcised, you will not have the prepuce that will be able to collect the, 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 the vaginal fluid of the female partner that could have infected him during or after the sexual intercourse. Yes. But if the male is not circumcised, his prepuce, which is the gland, that, uh, the, the prepuce, which is the part, the part of the, uh, the sex that covers the gland, will close on the vaginal fluid and after the sexual intercourse he will he may not be able to clean himself properly and within the 72 hours his own his own semen will meet his, his own semen will give he will have opportunity to mix with the vaginal fluid, and he will carry the infection on him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are these things that we should bring people to realize. Actually. The more males are circumcised, the more they are protected against AIDS. Wow. Mr. Ross, thank you but very people much. People should not confuse themselves because they should still... Good. I was about to add that. <laughs> But they still wear condom. <laughs> yeah, because uh, 0.0001% of chance of infection is still a chance of infection. That's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, so sir. So, if I can continue as I was talking about the stages. Can I? No, we'll, we'll come back. We'll come back. We'll come back. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll come back because you've given out too much information. I don't want you to leak everything, of course, that is in your calabash. But we did see it very, very clearly. I mean, looking at HIV AIDS, there's a lot more to it as a whole mechanism, as a whole infection than just what the average person meets on the surface of just understanding that you have to prevent yourself, you have to use condoms, you have to be, I mean, monogamous, essentially, all of those issues. You have to actually know the techniques. So we're realizing sensitization is very important and i think that that's where governments need to concentrate more now we're going to look at some aspects of what the governments have put forward they're asking for more funding but i want us to look at the issue now of malaria because we've already treated the idea of tuberculosis in its relation to malaria now notably when we're talking about hiv aids we're talking about malaria they say malaria actually does kill more people on the african continent than malaria this is very ironic. The World Health Organization's malaria report for 2012 said that the disease itself was concentrated in 14 endemic countries, which accounted for an estimated of 80% of malaria deaths. Now, the issue with malaria is that you get infected with the parasite, and either they treat you or you die. But with HIV and AIDS infection, just like Mr. Roach has pointed out, and we've seen in the video, we all know, you can live up to a fifth stage. Some people are infected 15, 20 years, they have no idea. So I want to put this idea now to you now, Mr. Roland. 
It's looking at all these initiatives that we've seen come forward for malaria now. We've seen pesticide nets handed out with um, some aspects of sensitization for the prevention of malaria. Do you think they're actually effective, granted that statistics would denote that more people die from malaria than HIV? Yeah, I think uh, they are actually effective because I can testify that at first sensitization in relation to malaria has not been uh, something very common. But you discover as the days go by, hospitals are taking the challenges, there are lots of uh, institutions that are put in place and commissions that are put in place to promote the knowledge and the awareness. And you discover most of the times when you get to a hospital, especially during um, um, the, when, when uh, maybe you see a pregnant woman, for instance, when, she, when they go during consultation, they are always drilled on the importance for them to guard against malaria. And they teach them simple techniques like keeping their environments clean. And they have songs that they usually sing during such special occasions when they go for consultation. I think that those awareness uh, that is being created goes a long way in combating uh, malaria. And looking at the other approaches that have been used, like the distribution of mosquito nets and others, I think that they're doing uh, a good job has been done in that domain because just uh, some months ago, I was so surprised that I sat right in my, in my, in my house. I, I think uh, if I can remember very well, I was in my bedroom and I had a knock on my door. And when I came out, I discovered there were agents who have been sent out yes. yeah, to distribute mosquito nets. And therefore, they had to take down they first of all had to number the number of persons, get the number of persons living in a particular environment, in a quarter, and pay house, and pay room, and all of that, so that they can get ample statistics, and that will enable them to better distribute the mosquito net. So I think that a, a great deal has been done in that domain, and is still being done. All right, so now I want to take that question and rephrase it in a different way now, Mr. Tamutan, noting once again the AU summit which recently passed. They concluded on this note, yep. African leaders commit to take actions towards the elimination of HIV and AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria in Africa. Instead of 2015, noting that they've missed the MDG yeah, goal, yeah, they've yeah. pushed it to 2030. 2030. Yeah. Now, do you think this is even going to be feasible? Uh, I want to think very much that it's feasible for them to, to attain this goal of eliminating HIV AIDS out of the continent 2030. But I must add that there's a challenge to be faced. You yes. know? This is, we're talking about a summit that was uh, attended by top uh, head of states and governments within Africa. And you will know that if they have to implement what is decided in their countries, then it needs strong political will. Really? They need to have a strong political will and see into it that they develop local strategies to see, to fight or communicate on how this uh, AIDS uh, pandemic can be fought within the, the, the continent linking to tuberculosis and malaria. Now, I want to add that this challenge also has to do with financing. Mm -hmm. You know, based on some reports we received, uh, we are told, I follow the reports from, from the summit, we are told that uh, just 15% of the African states are complying to the decision of uh, doing enough funding and applying the plans that have been put in place. So it would go by the proposals that are made by the President of Nigeria, Dr. Ebele John, uh, good luck, Jonathan. Then it means that they need to go on with regular checks. You are talking of 2030, which is just uh, 17 years to come. It's not far. It, it's not far, yes. actually. It, re it really means that every year, can we evaluate where we've gone? How far have we gone as far as an implementation plan is concerned? How far have we translated the policies which have been decided in summits, seminars, and so on? How far have we implemented it? And to what degree? If we can evaluate ourselves, then we can know where we're going to. Then also I want to add that it should not end at the level of the head of states and government. What is the community doing? Now we're talking about community, we're looking at the, the most basic unit of the community or the society, which is a family. Now that's where uh, the organization or the foundation which we represent comes to play. We will have to do much in sensitizing the family that this is not only something about presidents, about governments, about ministers, it's something that has to go right down to the home. The family needs to see what it means for us to be hygienic. It's very clear that, I mean, at the level of primary education, 
we all know one of the means of preventing malaria yeah. is to keep your compound clean yeah. is to make sure there's no standing water around it should make sure that there are no standing things around but now on our own we need to have a collective you know a collective identity in fighting this disease our next ice case on how many towns within africa would somebody find a little child dumping trash on the way mm, that's a question and, uh, yeah that's dump, question. dump trash in the way and ask the child that what are you doing are you supposed to dump that there i mean how many in how many francophone countries will somebody walking in town who stop and see a child and say that in a four pali silly or do you down the route in a four pali silly or do you see you know so it has to be collective and one thing i want to add is that in africa we come from a culture where we work and we work and live in a community we work and live in solitary so it means that if we were to resolve our problems, if we want to look at issues within Africa, then we have to look at the communal interest. And this has a lot to do with even the diseases and the insecurity which we suffer. So I think we should not end only at the level of the government. We have to meet the target of 2030. We also have to go right down to the family, go right down to the children, and I think youth to come in place. We shouldn't sit and grumble. We have work to do. Yep, to, yes. to add to what uh, <coughs> Mr. Tamutan is talking about, if you look at it critically, uh, I am so impressed at the work that has been done because already it has left the level of the leaders. If you look at Tisho, for instance, this is not a foundation that is created by any other person. It's created by a medical doctor, Dr. Mrs. von Elizabeth, and she is uh, a regional coordinator for HIV AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis precisely in Cameroon and the Little region. Now, taking into consideration that somebody who is a coordinator of a program that involves malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis is the founder of an initiative that is targeting curbing and eliminating this disease from the grassroots, that's from the family, the basic unit of the society. I think that by 2030, we must have gone a great deal and probably meet our goals of eliminating completely these diseases in our yes. society, and precisely well, in Africa. Right, now we want to transition with this concept, understanding like you did point out Mr. Tamutan, it's really a holistic approach. There's more to it than just looking at the health aspect of it. That's what I really realized that I want that our viewers, of course, stakeholders, any administrative officials who are following the program realize that it's a social issue, yep. really. Yep. I mean, we have sanitation being played behind this, not just medical centers. So if we put all of those concepts on the table and develop strategies to not necessarily just sensitize people, but these issues have to be enforced. Awesome. Yes. If people are littering, we need to create systems in which, knowing that it's going to create negative health effects, if they are caught, they're sanctioned. We need to create systems in which regularly campaigns come out for the communities to know on a particular day they do come out and tidy their environments. It's even enforced by local councils or local governments. Yeah. But we won't get this far without this information going forward. Okay. So what we want to do now is bring up this next footage. Um, we're talking about malaria and that aspect of sanitation. Okay. Let's really understand clearly what malaria is. Now in this next clip, it's very comprehensive. We'll see how malaria is transmitted directly from the second the mosquito does contact contact and bite the individual. Then we'll come back and we'll start to look in more detail at the AU summit. Okay. The malaria life cycle follows a devious path, swapping back and forth between mosquitoes and humans. This mosquito is infected with a malaria parasite. Because she is pregnant, she has become hungry for human blood. During the bite, she injects saliva to stop the blood from clotting. Her infected saliva also carries the malaria parasite. The parasite rides the bloodstream like a network of roads, seeking its first target. The core of your body's blood filter system, the liver. Sensing its arrival at the liver, the parasite searches for an exit.
a sentinel Kupfer cell is the entry point to liver tissue. Leaving the blood, the parasite infects a liver cell, killing one or more other cells on its way. Over the next few days, the parasite undergoes hundreds of nuclear divisions, copying its DNA over and over again. A single infected liver cell can create thousands of new parasites. The next generation of parasites are modified to infect a new target. Red blood cells. Inside a red blood cell, the parasite can hide from the body's immune system. The parasite slowly devours the contents of the infected cell and creates more parasites. The infected cell becomes sticky and grips onto blood vessel walls. Once mature, the infected cell bursts, spreading more parasites through the bloodstream. Malaria victims suffer fever, loss of blood, convulsions, brain damage, and coma. This year, 10% of people on Earth will be struck down with malaria. Countless millions have been killed by it. Most people who die from the disease are pregnant women and children under the age of five. So we do see it very clearly. That is exactly how malaria moves through the human blood system, through the bloodstream. And, of course, we know how many individuals it does kill. So it's good that people should really realize that there's nothing mystical about it. I know that some people might still think it's a spiritual type of illness at times, but it's about mosquitoes. And if they're prevalent in your environment, then they do bite you. They do transmit the parasite. You get sick and you can die from it. So it's really a serious issue that we know this summit recently addressed. Now we start to continue talking about now the summit specifically, noting that the idea of creating now the African Center for Disease Control and Prevention, what they call the CDC, or a health commission for Africa under the umbrella of the African Union was also proposed throughout this recent convention. Now, statistics given during the meeting of representatives revealed that African states, like you pointed out, have accepted to commit 15% of their funding, but only six of them do. So what I'm trying to realize now is this. Do you think the failure actually of governments on the continent to provide adequate health care resources can be attributed to the reason we have this weak state of health here in Africa? Because we're always asking for more funding, but we're realizing the situation is more social. So is it that not enough money was put into it? Let me start first with you, Mr. Roland Abru. I think that to an extent, the inadequate uh, availability of funds has a, a part to play. Mm -hmm. But that's not all because uh, you take, for instance, funds most of the times are targeted towards probably provision of medicines and uh, provision of uh, uh, materials not really for the purpose of control or targeting the basic organs of the society mm -hmm. but the one to target probably those who are already infected exactly yeah but i think that we can go into developing more local strategies like those that are being put in place like uh, a while ago my collaborator was talking about hygiene and sanitation and involving the local people I think that if we implement strategies like that, it's going to go a long way to rapidly curb this disease and the need for uh, much fine funding. I think that it, the, the governments will do more and better by not, not providing the much funding, but providing much education, just like you talked about sensitization. I think that adequate sensitization is more, should be more our cry than funding. 
actually. Yeah. Now let me take that question now in a different style and hand it now back over to you now, Mr. Tamukta. Specifically, do you think it would be better to improve the existing structures that are there as opposed to, uh, we pointed out, creating new structures. When they're talking about now creating a health commission for Africa or creating CDC's uh, central disease control centers under the AU, it means perhaps they're claiming they'll send more funds to ministries of public health in various African countries. And then those ministries will have the obligation now to create additional structures, building more buildings to do things that are already in existence. Do you think that that's going to settle the problem as opposed to not improving what's already there? Uh, I, I think very much that uh, funding is not really the problem very much. You know, we also had a tendency that uh, the problem in Africa is really money, you know. And money per se, it's not, uh, it's not cash. The real money is not cash. The real money is value. The real money is time. The real money is something that you can't touch. It's something that you give out to cause cash to come towards you. On that premise, I'm saying that uh, we already have structures which uh, we are working and if we have to to fight malaria in Africa, then we need to look at our local, uh, local realities. That means we have things that which are common to us, things that we normally use on a day-to-day -day basis without going through very big structures. It, it's possible that CDC, that like uh, it exists in the USA, could be very good, but for Africa, as we speak, it's better we start with what we're already working on, look at where we're filled, we correct them, then we work from there and see how we can improve. Like we were talking a moment ago, Africa is a, is a very communal kind of a, a continent where everything is looked in groups and looked right up to the point of the family. And talking about the, the family, now I'm saying that if we take, for example, a new strategy that has come up, which we call it Tatio, which looks at the family as a team, that everything has, has to be managed collectively. It would mean that uh, the already local uh, groups which were put in place, we need to review our strategies. We need to know where we have failed and come to the conclusion that now where we have failed, we need to make adjustments. And I think that's where I'm coming again with this aspect of sensitization. That's where I'm coming again with this aspect of looking at the family as the core which we can use. So I think uh, we should solve the problem where we are and rather than thinking of creating some other uh, structure you call CDC, uh, center of disease, uh, center center of disease, disease control. C center of yes. disease control. Thank well, you. Well, let me take this question now and throw it now to Mr. Alan Roche, who's also been pricked by that particular topic. And Mr. Roche, are you standing by? Yes, so I wanted to really give him this question that we're looking at the idea of the CDCs. I want to get his own reflection on whether is it actually valuable. Mr. Roche. Okay, it seems he's not quite available yet. We'll just continue with the discourse now. I wanted us now actually to deviate a little bit away from the aspect of the AU and health. Okay. Yes, because it was also very interesting to note that during this seminar, now we we'll mix a little bit of politics into the dialogue. Um, we note that actually the Sudanese president, um, that is uh, Bashir al uh, is um, Omar Bashir. Yes, that's right, Omar Bashir. He was present during the um, summit. And interestingly, um, there's an ICC warrant out for his arrest concerning war crimes which um, were committed against the southern Sudanese. Now, to a certain extent, this seemed to dominate and rival the news, whether the focus should be more on health or the focus should instead be more on whether he should be arrested. Now, I want to put this actually now, of course, we're moving chronologically. We have to start with Mr. Roland, then I'll, okay. I'll come back to you. Okay. Do you think the action of the NGO in Nigeria, which actually wrote on behalf of the Southern Sinist that um, Mr. Bashir should be taken into custody, do you think that it did actually take focus away from the seminar and the value of its promotion of HIV? And do you even think it was correct? That is what we want to talk about. Is it correct that we see... African states lobbying instead to have their own heads of states taken away and arrested at a time when we see that our own concerns of health are priority. You know, I want to say clearly here that the NGO did just the right thing because the NGO has an objective to meet. Mm -hmm. And part of that objective might involve uh, probably catering for the health 
of the population but i think it's more about the welfare everything about the welfare of the population inclusive mm -hmm. now in as much as we are seeing or the african leaders might be seeing the summit to be more important to them or important to the continent and they feel like the uh, the president that's omar el bashi was supposed to attend and uh, probably the action of the ngo might not be appropriate to them the ngo doesn't look at it from that perspective mm -hmm. the ngo looks at it from the perspective that human rights have been violated and because rights have been violated and we are out to fight for rights irrespective of what the circumstance might be we should not be distracted we cannot deviate from that which we have been called or that which brought us into the limelight so they need to still stick to their object i think that that was a laudable initiative an example for most of us to copy because most of the times we can set out for a goal but in the course of our action or at the course of implementation we are distracted by comments and other actions that are taking place but i think that the logical thing to do is if you set the goal no matter the destruction that comes stick yes. to the goal and the ngo did just the right thing to remain focused on human rights and focus only on that no distraction exactly Thank now you. let me put this question now to mr tamadan because yes. incidentally now um we had other institutions in Nigeria that attacked the presidency, okay. rebuking them for allowing, okay. that is okay. it, Mr. Bashir, to come to Nigeria. And the Nigerian presidency refuted on this basis that the African Union actually has told its 53 member states that it should not, of course, subdue to the authority of the ICC, even though they've signed treaties. Why? Because it does seem apparent that the ICC has some bias to arrest African leaders who have committed war crimes as opposed to Western leaders. Um, case in question, we can look at when uh, the former U.S. President George Bush visited yeah. Tanzania a few years ago. Okay. Um, there were certain human rights NGOs that had also written letters requesting he should be detained for war crimes against what happened in Iraq because the Iraqi war at the beginning of the millennium was an illegally staged war. It was in violation of the UN. And actually, following proper legal protocol, he should be brought before the ICC and questioned, and he should defend his stand openly and why he breached. And if any sanctions need to be taken, of course, if the ICC is an impartial institution, it is supposed to follow this suit. Now, do you think that the AU reasoning in that line is correct? Uh, I would uh, we want to look first of all what was the objective of the summit. The objective of this summit was to discuss about HIV AIDS, ma uh, tuberculosis, malaria on the continent. And now you know you find some NGO ICC and they're coming up to bring another topic into into the the summit. I think it was more of a distraction. So I th very much think that the African leaders they thought it wise to give room for their counterparts. Uh, El Omar El Bashi to express himself and even notice he expressed himself more towards the health issue of AIDS and H uh, AIDS, H uh, HIV and AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis in the continent. I think that was what was pertinent in that in that uh, summit rather than talking about uh, the politics. Maybe the NGO was just trying to use some means, uh, you know, some means opportunity to bring in their case, but I don't think it's a very right place to do so because what is very pertinent at that time. Let's look at the, the continental the continental problem. It was HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other uh, opportunistic diseases, not uh, not not politics, not uh, genocide. Like you mentioned earlier, uh, we have had other head of states within the world who have done even uh, worse than that. And I think we should start with the big fishes before going to the small fishes. That is really the reality is there. They shouldn't can try to distract the reality that is there. Yeah, can I can I look at that? I I want to say that. I'll differ a little with my collaborator because you see in as much as we are talking about the objective of the summit that the objectives or whatever actions to be taken after the summit will be irrelevant if there are no people to benefit from those actions mm -hmm. and so if there is an act or somebody is accused a president is accused of war crime against human or crimes against humanity I think that it is very obvious that we know that they are stating a point and that point if you look at it it might not be directly linked to the purpose for which the summit was convened but that is 
partly, if you look at INDEF, it is there because the summit is all about the welfare of the African population. Exactly. And so if you have a summit where you come up with laudable ideas and by the time you get to the, uh, your individual countries, you discover the entire population is wiped off, or what you use then is a summit to the entire Africa. So I think that the NGO did uh, something laudable and we need such NGOs. If we have NGOs like this, I think the African continent will be completely transformed. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Now, of course, we have just seven minutes left, uh, so we want to just start rounding up. Uh, I want to note that during this particular summit now, the main host country's president, that is uh, President Goodluck Jonathan, came forward and gave a speech in which he said that ownership and sustainability should form the basis of their next plan of actions, like what we've been talking about, and that their goals now should find solutions and challenges that can be seen in the continent, as opposed to always importing pharmaceutical drugs from outside and leaning so much on perhaps maybe the WHO and other funding institutions, more preference should be taken now to look at internal possibilities for treatment of HIV as well as other strategies. Now, what started to come to my mind is that we have this pro proliferate concept on the African continent of the use of natural medicine yep. in the treatment of HIV AIDS. Now, of course, as we're closing, I just want to put this question out to you, Mr. Tamutan. Yes. We're looking at the idea of HIV, AIDS, and its treatment for natural medicine. Malaria also can be treated with natural medicines. Yes. Even though conventional medicine has its priority, do you think that we could recommend the usage of herbs and natural medicines for the treatment of HIV, AIDS? Yeah, uh, I would like to talk about your question. I agree. Uh, I want to accept the fact that uh, we can use our natural medicine within Africa which will aid very much in the control and the curb of the HIV AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. Now the issue which we would had at one time with African medicine was that it wasn't a very organized uh, a very organized sector when it comes to African countries. But more and more we have come to realize that in most African countries they have come up with um, some sort of support in the, the research of African traditional medicine. I'll take a case of Cameroon. Uh, the country, Cameroon, has been organized such that all, uh, you call them, uh, you call them naturopaths, naturopaths, those involved in naturopaths. Yes, medicine, yes. Or Generally, internationally, they're called naturopaths. Naturopaths, doctors. yeah, naturopaths. It has been organized in such a way that for somebody to be considered really as a naturopath in Cameroon, there, there he needs to have an accreditation, you know, and uh, the, there's a top uh, professor who is involved in that. So it actually, that aspect involves two ministries. It involves the Ministry of Scientific Research and Innovation and the Ministry of uh, Health. Now, you know, realize that uh, we had a tendency within Africa that we just could take help to treat ourselves, but we didn't have a, a, a proper understanding of what dosage, for example. Exactly. At times, we didn't have a proper understanding of how hygienic should it be. But now, following the current research, they'll come to realize that some of these herbs can be used they and packaged used. in a way that it could be given a specific doses. And I can, I want to quote that enough research has been done in well, I really don't want to interrupt you there, but um, we have, we're totally out of time. We're totally uh, out of time. Okay. And with that, I'm sure that your point has been communicated, okay. that we do see Africa evolving behind the AU summit, essentially. And if they're ending on that note, that we're going to start to look internally for solutions, sure. then I do think that worthwhile what we took from the AU summit in Abuja was, of course, commendable. The effort, we should give a congratulations to our African heads of states. And that's where we're going to round up this edition of Pan-Africa Vision, broadcasted to you from Africa Media. Now, I've been your host, Ambe Fokwa, and we've been dealing with the concept of HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, of course, in the reflection of the recent Plus 12 special summit of the African Union Executive Council, which recently was held in Abuja, Nigeria. We'll continue to treat more topics concerning the African continent as we bring you that purely African consciousness here from this program. Thank you, and continue to enjoy more programs on Africa Media, your Pan-African channel.